All right, well, we will get started here and let people still trickle in a little bit as we go. Um, before we begin our announced program for this afternoon with environmentalist authors Drew Lanham and John Lane in conversation with Ellen Malfris, we're honored to welcome best-selling author Cassandra King Conroy, the Conroy Center's honorary chair, for a special welcome on behalf of our nonprofit Conroy Center. Thank you, Alan. I uh, just want to take a few seconds just to welcome everyone on behalf of the Conroy family and uh, the Pat Conroy Literary Center and to thank all of you for, for uh, being here and for being a part of our Conroy family. It's uh, nothing that we could have done to honor Pat would have pleased him more than, than this. And he would especially be interested in, in all the wonderful topics that, that have been explored on uh, the March 4th uh, events. And I'm really looking forward uh, to the events uh, today. I hope all of you are going to continue to watch. Uh, Pat was, as we know, uh, was an avid env environmentalist, and that is the uh, theme of, of our wonderful event today. So again, welcome and thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Conway. This afternoon, we're delighted to welcome back Dr. J. Drew Lanham, making his fourth appearance at March 4th, and doing so this year in conversation with one of his own mentors, John Lane, as moderated by our friend Ellen Malfris. Dr. Drew Lanham is the author of The Home Place, Memoirs of a Colored Man's Love Affair with Nature, and also of the poetry collection Sparrow Envy, Field Guide to Birds and Lesser Beasts, released by Hub City Press in a new expanded edition. He is a birder, naturalist, hunter conservationist, and an alumni distinguished professor of wildlife ecology and master teacher at Clemson University. He was recently recognized with the E.O. Wilson Award for Outstanding Science in Biodiversity Conservation. A 2014 inductee in the South Carolina Academy of Authors, the Palmetto State's Literary Hall of Fame, environmentalist, memoirist, poet, and novelist John Lane is one of the founders of the Hub City Writers Project in Spartanburg. Among his many books and awards, his selected poems, Abandoned Quarry, won the Southeastern Independent Booksellers Alliance Poetry Book Award. His nonfiction book, Coyote Settles the South, was named a finalist and a nature book of uncommon merit by the John Burroughs Society. And his first novel, Fate Moreland's Widow, published by Pat Conroy's Story River Books, was named an Independent Publisher Book Award Silver Medalist. His second novel, Whose Woods These Are, was recently published by Mercer University Press. Dr. Lane recently retired as Professor of Environmental Studies and Director of the Goodall Center for Environmental Studies at Wofford College. Moderator Ellen Malfris lives and writes beside the May River in her native low country and beneath the mountains of Western Montana. She studied under James Dickey and was also mentored by her friend, Pat Conroy. She's the professor of English and the writer in residence at the University of South Carolina, Beaufort. A writer of poetry and fiction, she is the author of the debut novel, Untying the Moon, published by Pat Conroy's Story of Road Books. Please welcome our speakers today, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Holland. Those of you who have been fortunate enough to tune in to others of these <laughs> events hosted by the Pat Conroy Literary Center know Holland already. I was just telling her before we began what a pleasure it is. She has been with us for a while now interning at the, at the Literary Center and to watch the blossoming of this young lady is just such a pleasure that her poise and her everything about her. I'm crazy about this kid. Cassandra, thank you so much for joining us and other members of the Conroy family that I know are out there. It's good to have y'all here and everybody. But so mostly, not mostly, but I'm very happy indeed to be here with John and with, with Drew. This is, a, this is gonna be fun. Both of you have new books. John's novel, Whose Woods These Are, is already out. And Drew's new edition of Sparrow Envy will be out in a few weeks. And I'm going to ask you guys to give us a little teaser reading from two books. But before we do, can you 
tell these folks a little bit about your relationship and the, the breadcrumbs that you left along the way from John and you know, was it love at first sight <laughs> of yours? Tell us a little bit about how this, this relationship came to be. Drew, you, you're good with that story. Tell that story about going up to Vermont. Well, Ellen, well, thank you to the Conroy family, Cassandra, thank you so much. Jonathan, thank you for having me back. Um, and Ellen, thank you for, for hosting our, our conversation. I, I guess during the pandemic, they'd have to be sourdough breadcrumbs, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, I, you know, Ellen, I was in Vermont at my first writing workshop, not really knowing what I was doing, but um, had gone up there really stalking Janice Ray's voice to hear her read out of ecology and, um, and met so many wonderful people up there. But everybody I would meet, they would say, oh, you're from South Carolina. You must know so-and-so, and they kept mentioning this guy, John Lane. And they said, you know, you're close to, to Wofford College. It's just a hop and a skip. You need to meet him. And I had no idea who he was. So I had to leave home to find home, <laughs> uh, is, is, is often the case. And so I got back from that first writing workshop. And I think it was pretty much love at first sight because John, um, the first the first bit of his work that I read was Waist Deep in Black Water, and I fell in love with his writing then. And then um, we got to talk and I heard his voice, right? And so he he's always been true to who he is and true to, this is gonna sound sort of weird, um, but, but true to the South in a way that I think is important. You know, as, as a white Southern man, who understands the history, but wants better than the history uh, gave us. So yeah, that, that, was, that was it. So even though it's a little more than a hop and a skip through Greenville, um, we, we find ways to, to communicate almost every day, right, John? Yeah, yeah. I wanna, I wanna thank you, Ellen, for doing this and thank Jonathan and the Conroy Center and and the uh, Conroy family too. I want to throw my my thanks in there too, and 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 say that um, meeting Drew was one of the most important friendships I've ever formed. Um, when I um, began to hear these rumblings, and I remember I remember it was this conference. Um, I, I was stupid enough to hold a conference with 900 um, environmental. Um, scholars and writers in Spartanburg in 2007. I was the host for a conference called ASLI, Association for Study of Literature and the Environment. And I didn't have much time to do anything during that conference except ride around and put small fires out um, on a small college campus. It had never been held on a small college campus before. But all during that, I kept hearing these rumors, you know, that there was this black nature writer from over at Clemson that milkweed was was courting like crazy and trying to get into a restaurant so he could sign a contract um, while he was there. And, I, and they said, Drew Lanham, Drew Lanham, he's, he's going to really blow it away with this book of his called The, the Home Place. And, um, and then right after that, we met and we became fast friends. And as Drew says, um, there's hardly been a day in what, Drew, five, six years now, maybe? Or longer. Yeah, it's longer. That we have not either texted or talked or seen each other um, and um, it's been a really really powerful and important friendship for me and I really um, I really I really love Drew's work and and believe in it and and know how much he's going to offer and continue to give to to environmental writing which we call now rather than nature writing we can't say that anymore <laughs> environmental writing in the south and um, and in in the in the in the world just remarkable. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, John. I, I, I consider my I consider myself a, an adventitious sprout of the John Lane tree. So kind of like sweet gum, right? You know, um, <laughs> I, they, those sprouts spring up where you least expected. Yeah, it really means a lot, especially now that I'm retired and um, don't have that classroom situation. It's great to know I've got all these friends who, who actually listen to some of the things that I I write and say. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I consider you both fortunate. That's a very sweet story. All right, so, I mean, I don't know if your publishers made this happen. You know, these guys have books coming out that are even in the same color palette. <laughs> <laughs> just sort of, you know, go together nicely. <laughs> so, who wants to give us a tease first? Um, you go ahead. Okay, I, mine's three minutes long, so it's nice. It's a little tease, but I think it'll it'll give you an idea of what this novel's about. You're gonna think from the three minutes that this was this some big nature tome, but it's actually a a, a murder mystery. I like to call it a did he do it rather than a who done it because this character, um, Jay Mitchell, that you're gonna meet on the first page, basically, I think I don't know if it was Jonathan who said it or somebody in a review said this book is like a ping pong match of just bouncing back and forth constantly between these four narrators trying to figure out if this old man is dead or not dead in this river bottom um, mm -hmm. where he's um, where he's missing. But um, the I know Jonathan said this in the review he did of it, that the, the woods is as powerful a character in this book as the people. And I, I did that on purpose. I'm a big fan of um, the overstory by um, and by, by the overstory um, by Richard Powers and and to me landscape and this is I know we're going to get to this later Ellen but to me this is one of the most important Pat Conroy points of this of this panel to me is how much the coast was when I read um, Prince of Tides a character in that novel and that that inspired this book I think although I'm as Drew says I'm the poet laureate of the Piedmont so. <laughs> Here we go. This is called The Woods Stretch for Miles. The first woods grew up far back in time, ancient as the last ice age, back beyond any notion we would call now. For eons, the woods, most of it deciduous, cantilevered, stable, rolled unbroken in every direction, untroubled except by an occasional cataclysmic storm or raging lightning sparked wildfire. The space undulating in hilly ridges and deep cut floodplains someday to be called the Piedmont. If the woods were steeped in anything back then, it was deep rot, and rot stained the loamy shadows, almost a rainforest, and filled the air with fecund scent. To have entered those woods would have been to give away to a place of impenetrable density a green wall of entwined smilax, poison ivy, muscadine, Virginia creeper, and cross vine. The old pre-settlement woods had a reverent quality to them, as deep woods also always do, but the recent woods weren't such a grove, sacred or otherwise. There was something more undersized about them that a word like grove does not embrace. By post-settlement times, the woods were a remnant what was left of the remaining upland southern hint of primeval forest, the big woods itself, little patches of it miraculously surviving and emerging whole into the present every morning. Like it was the first day of creation, this one stretching over sections of two full USGS quads, if what you are interested in is maps. The woods could still seem vast, except for places where there were a few game trails, some widened by the regular treading of Jay Mitchell, who now, generations later, hunted there almost daily. The contemporary ridges were spiked with volunteer and planted pines high enough next to where Long Shoals Road now ran, to the mixed pines and hardwoods cascading down the slopes all the way into the bottoms, thick with oaks, hackberries, Horned beans, beaches, sycamores, and matted mud and a macadame of fallen timber on the bottom's floor. Once you were down in the bottom at river level, it was still bug ruled and humming all the way to the stream through pawpaw, box elder, ash for almost a mile. And then if you crossed at one of the shoals, it was a mirroring mile of forest up to the top of the next far ridge on the other side. The slopes were so steep in places, it was said no plow had ever plowed them. The topsoil might have been 20 inches deep in those spots, and there were few gullies, slashes through the forest, 
a feature common to most Piedmont land. There were dark olivine cliffs that some people called a gorge, like something you'd see in the mountains. The rock was raw and weepy in one particular stretch of the cliffs. And though there weren't as they weren't as narrow as a slot canyon, slot canyon, western, <laughs> a slot canyon um, in the place down there where the cliffs were only 30 feet apart, the sun only penetrated at midday. The woods were, un were known and familiar. The trees all had names, scientific and common ones. And all autumn, they shouted at the dawning days. There were 14 different species of Quercus, oaks with leaves like hands, stained copper yellow and bright red by November. There were other yellow ones too, the high ground hickories and the poplars. And there were streamers of tangerine sourwood branches bursting from the leaning trunks of the mature twisted trees, the forest contortion artists, anything to find the light. The scarlet of the dogwood understory sprinkled down the slopes speaking their language too. The maples had their dialect, red as flame. And then the closer you got to the river, the sweet gums and sycamores yelled burnt orange verbs at the dawn. Jay still called this place the woods, but there was no denying it had been owned and surveyed over time. But there was no denying it had changed hands often as well. And on other parts, the title floated from generation to generation, encumbered and unencumbered, depending on how much attention the owners paid to taxes and wills. There were property lines, some even painted on trees. Some were recently delineated by stabs of rebar, pounded into the earth and tied with orange survey tape and with their tops painted bright yellow. Even though the woods had been divided up by legal transaction, it was still more than what a contemporary manager of space could grasp or understand. It was often because of slope, a logger's unsolved conundrum, a real estate agent's never listed vex holdings. All these experts lacked the tools to contain the woods on a spreadsheet. For eons, treetop to bedrock, through all this time, the woods told its story to those who would listen. But the people who had lived there for 200 years made their stories too. And they planted those stories in the woods, the way maples spread their helicoptering seeds in the spring. The stories floated down and rooted in the land. But we are not dealing with eons here. The heart of this story takes place in only one day, mostly in one place those words. That is beautiful, John. Thank you. Thank you so much. You do such a good job in that book. Uh, as you mentioned of making those woods the central character. That fabulous opening really sets the stage and, and the woods never leave the reader's my, you know, these people are all running around doing things and really, you know, we're like, whatever. What, what we care about is the woods, like what's going to happen? And that deer lying there, you know, that's what, yeah. <laughs> you do such a good job of making us. I could not have written this book without Drew Lanham because I'm no hunter. And I had to read all these passages to Drew and say, what have I screwed up that some hunter is going to jump all over me and say, this could not happen or this is, I mean, I, I've been in the woods a lot with hunters, but I'm not somebody who shoots no. deer. And so, yeah, so yeah that deer is. We, and we can, and that's what we care about. I mean, the people are sort of like, yeah. Although I've got to tell you that the, the dog house construction was, I was so taken with the woods and just wanted to be in the woods and like, never mind the people, but then, um, the doghouse construction really that that that's when I said, all right, let's see about this Jay guy. All right. Yeah, he's let's, got some he's got some stuff going on. He's got some stuff going on. And that stuff's going on in the same neck of the woods a little bit later chronologically, but the same neck of the woods that Fate Morland's widow. Yes. Yeah, uh, that's one of the things I'm doing is um Jonathan knows all about this. I've talked to him endlessly about it. But I'm trying to set all my novels until I get tired of it in the same mythic 
Southern County in the Piedmont of South Carolina, Morgan, South Carolina. So yeah, Fort Fate Mullen's widow, you know, happens in the thirties and eighties and this happens now. So, so it's, I just keep going back to that. Yeah. True. So Sparrow Envy, this, this is going to be such a treat for you readers when this comes out in a few weeks. This, this, as most volumes of poetry are, this slim volume that is absolutely bursting with content. It's, it's part love story and part lament. It's a, a meditation on the madness of the world currently. And it's got funny stuff in it. Drew Lamb is a funny guy. That uh, Bo Hickett Road poem, I just <laughs> laugh out loud. You know, I mean, yes, we know the, you know, the camouflage black, camouflage black burger, you know, <laughs> incognito and those little witticisms, but there is some genuinely good, funny stuff. I mean, you really have done a beautiful job, and I don't know who helped you um, with the arrangement of the sequence of this material, but it, what a beautiful ride to, to make us laugh and, and cry and think and, and rejoice. So I can't wait to hear what you're going to read. Well, well, thank you, Ellen. Uh, you know, first, I mean, you listen to John and, and, and hearing him, sometimes it used to be that, you know, back in the old days, when you travel from town to town and meet people face to face, John would call and he'd say, we talk and he'd say, let me share with you what I've, I've written and we share with one another. And I remember the first time he read me some of what he read today. And, um, and, and I almost had to pull over. Right? So, you know, that, that poet sensibility and the lyricism of, of being able to describe a place or paint that, that sort of picture you know, a lot of us know um, Philip Juris and, and his wonderful landscapes. And I, I think Philip is sort of the, the visualization of what many of us try to do with words to get to that point of, of, of evoking a scene, right? So I'm, I'm going to share a couple of different things. Um, this, this, this book, Ellen, is that started with John in Holocene Press. Um, as, as, as Sparrow Envy Jr. kind of back in the day. And, and then, you know, it's, it's molted and, and uh, gone into several plumages. And now it's, it's with Hub City and Meg Reed um, just did an absolutely amazing job with that. And um, when it was tossed back to me and um, as an arc and, and Meg said, okay, we need to think about the order here. And I struggled and struggled and struggled and tried to do all this complex stuff in one day it just hit me upside the head like a ball peen hammer and said, duh, birds and lesser beasts. So it's divided into birds and lesser beasts. So the first thing that I'm gonna share is, um, is a poem that I like and in part because I have a love affair with mules. Um, and I have a love affair with mules because of, of 40 acres that was supposed to go along with them. But um, you know, they've, they've been, uh, you know, they've been the big burden that, that's carried so many of us. So this first piece I'm going to share is, is um, a prose poem called Hard Pan Life. Hard Pan Life. I once watched a mule team hitched collar to harness to yoke to plow, strain and heave as the blades cleaved apart the hard pan soil as if it were a dirty sea. Up team, up Beulah, let's go Jim. The order came firm, but fell soft on the pair. They knew the work ahead, looked back at the brown skinned man briefly to make sure it was the one they could trust, leaned into the collars and took off. Every muscle rippled beneath bay and roan coats. The breath of the bay came heavy, but even hot through an open mouth with yellow horse teeth grimaced bare. His jackass ears taken from his mammoth jack dad 
lay back against the short cropped mane and thick neck as if to cut the tension hanging thin, thick in the September air. The broad shouldered roan, the younger Jenny, barely broke a sweat, her ears shorter by a finger, the product of her Percheron mama. She stood a hand or two above the male, but knew already how to measure her longer gait to make the twosome one. Head down and eyes straight ahead, her nostrils flared as heart's engine stroked the piston deep within. Her and him, Beulah May and Jim, they leaned into the work with equal strain. The leather collar creaked as if it would break but never gave way. With hooves gaining purchase, with barely another word from the old black man holding the reins, they knew well the terrain and went at the job with nothing but oats, wheat straw, and rest as pay when the lower field was done. The ground roiled up as they steady went on. Old forged steel sliced into Cecil loam as knife whetstone honed might cut into hot fresh bread. Laid it open so you could see clay deep down coming up red. Yard by yard, the team plodded on. Deed and hawed at the rose end, it seemed they knew the ground better than the old brogained farmer. His 43 acres sat large, fields rich with creek flood alluvium. The dirt before the blade became friable soil behind it ready to receive seed and rain for the next refrain of winter wheat to sprout up and throw heads when all else green was dead. The roan braid, the bay followed suit. A barred owl let loose a call in response from the swamp as the evening dimmed to dusk, then fell. Each step closer to the acreage being fully tilled, the pair seemed stronger in the harness. Step up now. The driver yet smiled, harness laid over his own shoulder so he could feel the rest of the way home. They knew the old barn was that much nearer. They leaned in harder still. Even mules need downtime. Beasts of burden are not soulless bags of flesh and bone, but feeling beings in need of caring. The plowman knew this. The land they all worked grew crops well, but held the legacy of too much bitter before it bl ever bloomed sweet. He owned now what bondage ancestors could not. The mules were a promise made to times past, a promise kept to those never met. The team sweat lathered and tired, deserved watering, earned dinner, needed that rest. An extra measure of grain was in order, a bath would wash the sweat away with warm so soapy water, curry out the matted hair to ease the strain, then rub the liniment on to ease fatigue. On the way in, the old man would slip Jim a ripe apple from the orchard, give Beulah May the carrot from his pocket that he rooted up from the garden. The day closed in on night as the last rose heaved open. I heard the leather creaking the rigging buckles ringing. Equine exhaustion smells heavy, sweetly musty horse power generating. I watched from the road until I could not see, imagining then myself in the furrow, pulling the plow with no help. The owl called again to remind me of the time. The yoke I bore was neither oil, leather, nor long rain but being myself with all the expectations from everyone else. The hardest ground to plow was living fully without worry, not in the past gone on or future yet to come, but in the present hard pan now. So I, I guess you'd call that a little bit of, of, a, of a meditation um, in these mules but um, again, inspired, inspired by ancestors and the promise and, and ultimately my desire one day, um, my desire one day to be behind a pair of, of draft mules. Hmm. Um, this, this piece I'm gonna share now, Ellen, is, um, 
is back to the bird side a little bit. You'll note in this book that yeah, it's divided into birds and lesser beasts, and the lesser beasts include um, humans, but but there are also these field marks um, throughout the book that um, that John helped me organize that that really sort of I think go towards um, as a field mark would point to the ID of something sort of definitively give a mark as to, you know, a cardinal's crest or a crow's blackness. Um, this, this sort of fits in that place and it's called lifeless list. So a takeoff on the whole life list of a bird, but lifeless list. Do you know how hard it is to admire the plumage on even the most beautiful bird? To separate one warbler's chip note from the other or count the telltale hind wing spots on some butterfly. Whether the fox's track is of a gray or red, to listen for the trill duration of the next door toad or remember the name of that wildflower or gather the energy to find the Latin binomial of a beetle in a field guide. To remember whether I'm above or below the Conant and Collins Mason Dixon line, to know whether the frog in my backyard plastic pond is green or bronze, to understand just how many slimy species split out like taxonomic shrapnel from the glutinosis line. It is not any easier to split differentially textured dorsal hairs or see rictal bristles or differences in marginal scutes or divine the wartiness of semi-permeable skin beasts into the appropriate pigeonholes, or even give a damn what the name of anything is beyond the last black body that lay still after being hunted down jogging, or knee choked, or shot while sleeping by the police. Beyond the streaming calculus of half million plus suffocated by virulence it is a lifeless list accruing, I'd rather not keep, growing longer by the hour, lengthening daily. There's little room left in my heart now for other names. Bird can just be bird, lizard, just that. For today, at least, list me please alongside somehow human being still alive. So um, that's just, that's sort of a flavor of Sparrow Envy. Um, some of the birds, lots of lesser beasts, and, um, and, and hopefully some things to think about from, you know, a couple of hundred years ago to present day. Beautiful. Thank you. That's, I'm trying not to pick favorites because I've only read through it once, but, you know, you find yourself making the check mark and then the bigger check mark and then <laughs> your asterisks and all of that. And that the, the lifeless list is, is an incredibly powerful, powerful piece. So while we are there, let's talk a little bit about how we balance activism and, and sanity. Mm people who enjoy the great outdoors, we enjoy wildness, we feel at home in wild spaces and know the need for it. But when we go there, are we running away or are we doing what we need to maintain the balance that it takes to carry on? There are the, the great big problems of the planet and of the of the critters on it and the people on it and the things that are happening everywhere that break our hearts and cause us to feel we must step up and do something. But where do you find the balance? What is the right answer of, as I say, that, that way to, to engage on the one hand, do something about the things that need to be done. So go walk in the woods. I'd, um, I'm going to take, make a really quick um, assertion here um, that one of the biggest revelations I've had in the last 10 years, and I'm out 
a lot, as you say, is there is no away mm. anymore. I mean, I remember 20 years ago, I used to believe that I could go to Yellowstone and if I walked off the trail, I was away somehow. But now I realize, and Drew has helped me understand this, that we're never away from, um, we're never away from policy. We're never away from, from history. I mean, I used to think I could walk off of history, walk out of history. And I know now that I can't. And um, so that has given me actually more of a sense of um, mission than, um, than sadness is that I can't get away. It's a fascinating perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Drew? John, Ellen, um, John is exactly right. I think rather than thinking of it as running away from problems, we're running to the problems that we, we know we need to solve. And I mean, and, 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 and gaining inspiration and, and soul food from that is not exclusive of the desire to, to do better. So, you know, I always give the example in the low country of looking across these expanses of rice marsh and, and never, ever, um, never, ever discounting the beauty of what you see and the wonder of those birds that are there, but understanding that they are there in part because Black Hands created so much of that landscape. And that before that, indigenous peoples had peopled, um, populated the landscape. So, you know, I, I, I tell folks sometimes in order to see birds more clearly and, and to, to be on this mission to save them, I mean, selfishly, you know, we ought to want to conserve so we can go out the next time and see more, right? But, but conservation has at its core this selflessness to save not for self, but for others who you may never know. So there are those behind you, um, my ancestors who who, who work so much of this land, I have to take my binoculars down to see more clearly. That doesn't mean that I don't see the birds, but, but I'm, I'm looking through time. So I think, Ellen, there's a way, like John said, to, to mission this work. Um, and, and, and John and I, he didn't tell you this, but, but we're sort of contrarian in that we both still think of ourselves as nature writers not as environmental writers, but that to create beauty in that nature writing is important. And, and, and John has helped me to hold on to that, that, yeah, we're in the Anthropocene, the age of woe. Um, but, you know, you can drive people crazy with constant bad news. So, you know, I try to help people understand that, yeah, a police stop could end my life. Um, but, but how do I find joy? You know, I say joy is the justice we give ourselves. So I gotta find that joy. And that joy is in that next bird. It's in that next corner that's turned. It's at waking up at three o'clock and seeing those stars. Um, and, and, and so John and I help feed one, because we have these deep discussions. We're two Southern men, a, a black man from Edgefield and a white man from Spartanburg we have some pretty deep discussions on a daily basis that um, we, I don't think people have them enough. So, you know, it's how we live in this age of woe um, is, is the things that, that make you say woe and say, Jesus, did you see that? And then you can be prepared for, you know, the next sack of bricks that's thrown on your back. Otherwise you're just gonna crumble beneath the woe and never stop to notice that beauty. So, so whoa becomes whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see yeah. that? I mean, yeah. 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 That's the way I felt last night at 3 a.m. on Drew's deck looking at those stars. <laughs> yeah. That is wonderful. Yeah. Marty Murray, um, someone I didn't know about until Terry Tempest Williams turned me on to her. She, she talks about how while are bearing the weight of all this this woe at, at the end of the day we must dance and mm. what that, that dance is for you whether it's standing there 
looking at Orion's belt and all its glory or, or seeing that savannah sparrow in the marsh or whatever it is, that, that is the dance that, that we must continue to do if we're gonna to hold it together. Mm -hmm. All right, let me ask you guys this. So folks, I think in general, enjoy the outdoors, right? Warm summer day of, of you know, seeing a, a heron fly over. But for some of us, and I'm gonna say the three of us on this stage, so to speak, um, are, are this way, that we would rather be outside anytime than inside. And, and not only that, we feel called to wild spaces, whether it's a brambly woods or, or whether it is the, the precipice of the Grand Canyon, we, when we stand in the redwood forest, we are the ones who can't wait to, to get back further into the hush and, and enjoy the majesty. We're not the ones who say, all right, now let's find that one that's got where you can drive the car through, you know, we hunger for this. We, we thrive on this. Are we different somehow? Are we, uh, yes, there are people who grew up maybe with parents who took them to wild places and said, behold, but plenty of us didn't. I, I, my, my background is more like Drew's. I grew up in Great Swamp, you know, out in the country and, and was around, you know, the rural scenes, but it's not like I was taught to behold these things. Are we somehow genetically hardwired? Are we some throwback to, or are we in fact, um, post, are we ahead of the game? Are we, are we evolving into post Anthropocene creatures who can somehow adapt to wildness once uh, we humans have wiped ourselves off the planet? Hmm. Are we different? Hmm. You know, Helen, it, it's funny, last night, um, our friend David Taylor, uh, we were talking about this underneath those stars and, and I, all I can equate it to is there's something, if you think about some of what we do, sort of, um, you know, wandering to the precipice of some deep chasm, hopefully not too close, but to that precipice and wanting to, to, to sort of feel that upsweep of wind or uh, to, so to know what that raptor feels beneath its wings before it slips off, or whether it's walking in a deep woods. Um, you have, there's something that you have to overcome to do that evolutionarily speaking, because our, our hominid ancestors, um, didn't necessarily look for that, right? They weren't look that there, there was that you wanted to find the safest route, the most open space. Now that, that openness is part of the reason that I think I feel at home on Montana Prairie, right? I mean, that's the, that Savannah brain. Um, that's that's working there. But when I'm in those deer woods in the morning and I have pulled myself out of a warm bed at 3 or 4 a.m. to walk in dark woods, I don't feel safe until I have climbed that tree. And I think at that point, evolutionarily, just like seeing that open savanna, I'm like, okay, I'm safe. Because my ancestors, until they found enough confidence in fire and other things, you know, at night, they were in the evening, they were getting up. So I think there is something evolutionarily speaking that have given the chance, right? Um, that that we seek, and it and it may be in in a piece of fresh, juicy fruit that you eat. And even though you don't know where that feeling comes from, it's different than anything you have ever had. So I I, I do think Ellen, there's something hardwired in there. But I think it's something that we've also, in some ways, worked hard to civilize ourselves away from. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would, um, I would add two two examples, and then and then make a statement. Um, I automatically, when you were talking, said, "Well, there is some research, or or at least ideas or data pointing toward it being hardwired." I think of E.O. Wilson's biophilia. E.O. Wilson's an evolutionary biologist, and this wasn't research he did, although he did do some research to suggest that we do, that there are some of us, and maybe in, in us all is a love 
of all things biological. So there's biophilia. There was an he had a whole book called that. And the other is a crazy. Um, I don't know how this has stood up over the test of time. Um, maybe some of our 42 participants are are academically um, engaged enough um, in this area to know that. But there was a Harvard sociologist named Howard Gardner who did work in the 1980s, I think, on various types of genius that people could have. And he had these bunches of types of genius. He would say that you couldn't judge Michael Jordan by anything except spatial. And he had like two geniuses at work. And he was a genius in both of them. And you couldn't judge him by the other nine geniuses in the same way that, you know, I'm, a, I'm terrible with mathematics and I would be so sad if somebody judged my um, life against um, analytical numer um, numerate genius. And there is that. There are people who are geniuses of that. Well, Gardner revised his, um, his research and said that there was, there was an environmental genius, that there were certain people that for whatever reasons, in an environment or in, in, in their lives were engaged at such a level that they, that they were as smart about in the environment and the relationship between things as, as Einstein was about physics or Michael Jordan is about the basketball court, um, space, about space. Um, and um, that, that, so there, there's that possibility. And I don't know if that's nurture or nature either one of them. I mean, I, I, I don't know, but there, there are, is some indication that we're engaged, we're activated by some of us, by the natural world in ways that others aren't. I've seen it when I teach. Drew, you've probably seen it when in a class of 30. Oh, yeah. yeah. Not all of them activate, but some of them do. Yeah, I, I think it's nature and nurture, John. And Ellen, I think... Um, you know, Ellen, coming up rurally as we did, and the set of skills that you you needed to, you know, just being aware of, of where you were, or, um, you know, I take something as simple as, I know lots of people who, uh, bird song has no impact on their sleep. I mean, I, me, I, I can't sleep past that bird song. Now, part of that is, um, in, in my brain and, and, and telling me nature, telling me that I need to get up, but it's also the nurture of my grandmother saying, don't let your daddy catch you in the bed because it's work time, right? So, you know, both of those sort of converge in this place. So when the wren sings, I can still in my brain sometimes hear my daddy's 420 John Deere tractor cranking up, turning over. Mm. And, and I knew that I only had so much time, you know, and for better or for worse, you know, that, that, that genius that some of which we learn, but then some which I think is embedded there, um, you know, but, but it's, I, I, I do think it's something that we have worked societally against, right? Um, we've cleaned up everything. Most people, don't they, you know, if they eat meat, they don't know that it ever blinked. So, um, and if you don't eat meat, they, people don't have any concept of how many acres it takes to sustain your body on a plant-based diet. So all of those are things that I think we need awakening to in all of our various iterations in all of our various forms. And John and I talk about it daily. I, I, you know, we said, John, how many pages did you pull off from your that we had communicated over the past X number of years? <laughs> how many pages? Yeah, you had counted the pages. You had pulled off all of the messaging or something. It was thousands, right? Oh, yeah. Our, we have these, this thousand page conversation going back 10 years that sooner or later, one of us is going to print off this Facebook <laughs> messenger, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for those thoughts. It's fascinating to consider. It's absolutely fascinating. All right, we you um, have we mentioned a couple of names here of nature writers uh, of old um, environmental writers. 
um, have reason to believe that perhaps a goodly number of folks in our audience are interested in these things. That's why they're here listening to us today. Tell us who some of your, I don't know if I want to use the word favorite, but where do you go for inspiration? Uh, um, well, we can talk about, you know, the Aldo Leopolds and, and that crowd, the Thoreaus and all this, but I think I'm more interested in like, now, the, the Barry Lopez, the Matheson, the Terry Tempest Williams, where is the wisdom? Where do you go for inspiration and who might you recommend our audience to, to check out if they don't know? Um, I've been, I'm going to mention three people. Um, one I've already mentioned, and that's um, the massive novel by Richard Powers called The Overstory. If you want to and some people don't like Richard Powers. Some people feel like his characters are flat and um, he's, he's, he's too idea driven. Um, he's not so much character driven, but I really love that novel. It's a, um, a remarkable novel with trees at the heart of it. And um, new, brand new scientific ideas about the way trees communicate drives this, 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 this novel. And um, I read it and I was just blown away by it. I, I read it and then I went right back and started over and listened to the whole thing on um, on books on tape um, because I was so so taken with it. Um, he was so um, he was so taken by trees, big trees, old growth trees, that he moved from California to the Smokies to be closer to old growth. That he um, and now he lives somewhere up near Gatlinburg, um, and so he can walk every day into old growth. And um, so anyway, I, I, I would recommend Richard Powers um, and may, maybe you'll like that. And the other two are um, poets. Um, um, one's a poet novelist, poet um, essayist, and they're from two different cultures. And um, the Canadians and the British have been very, very important to me the last decade. I've probably read more Canadian poets than I've read American poets in the last decade because I like what they're doing with, with nature. Um, and the poet that I will um, mention is almost unknown in America, and yet he's, a, he's won all the major awards in Canada. He's in his 70s now, late 70s, Don Mackay, M-C-K-A-Y. And um, here's, his, here's his collected poems. It's called Angular Unconformity. And you can tell from that that he, he writes a lot about geology and deep time. And he also is a poet who um, struggled and came to terms with the, the, the revolution in um, literature, literary criticism in the 20s that sort of basically said language can't apprehend the world. It's impossible, but we've still got to keep trying. Mm -hmm. And so his poems are full of puns and jokes and really fun poems. And I, 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 I love him. And the last one I'll mention is um, a Scottish poet named Kathleen Jamie, who is better known, I think, as a, 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 a nonfiction writer now. Um, she's got a, a, a beautiful book um, about archeology span that just came out, about her in, in late life after struggling with cancer. Sounds like Terry Tempest Williams with dealing with that stuff. Um, she decides she's gonna go to Alaska and to Scott in, in her own country and and work as a volunteer on an archeological site. And she, the whole book is, is about that. And so um, these books have really opened me up, um, particularly because they're not books or writers that Americans have ever heard of mostly. Mm -hmm. now, I could say Robert McFarlane, I love him, but everybody's reading Robert McFarlane now and I think everybody should, but I think Kathleen Jamie and Don Mackay are really powerful writers. Thank you for turning turning us all onto that. Spell her name, please. J A M I E, Jamie. Okay, okay. And the latest awesome. book, I can't remember the name of it. It's the archaeology one. is pretty phenomenal. And it does have an American publisher, one of the big New York publishers. Terrific. Drew, thoughts? You know, I I'm constantly amazed. I thinking about the list. I mean, it's expansive, but. I've been thinking recently about the influence of women in my life as both a scientist and a writer, and it's been amazing. 
you know, I mentioned Janice, right? And, and how I, and, and I teach writing in part by voice. And, 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 and I think we need to hear writers read. So, you know, I, my, man, my list, um, now I've, I've Amy um, Neju, uh, Neju Kumatatil's book, World of Wonders, that's on the bestsellers list now from New York Times. Amy is a professor at Ole Miss, but and a poet, um, but has done an amazing job in this book of, of talking about a brown girl to, to brown woman's evolution as a naturalist across the American landscape. Um, just an amazing book, that, but that has each chapter is, I mean, it might be narwhals or peacocks or or other things, but each chapter is linked to her life in some way, um, and her brown life um, in the United States. And I think that's important, different voice. Um, Helen McDonald, uh, so, you know, go across the pond and, and Helen um, has become a good friend, but, you know, H is for Hawk, most people are familiar with her latest book, Vesper Fights. But Helen is such an amazing thing, right? Um, and, and the way she thinks, but then in the way that she translates that evocatively, I think is important. Um, so I, I, I love her voice. Someone that many people haven't heard of, but um, we talk on a pretty regular basis. And um, Dorinda Dahlmeyer, who is, um, we used to run the, the um, Institute for Environmental Ethics in Athens at University of Georgia, but is a force for conservation in the South and behind so many good things. But I will never forget Dorinda reading me one of her essays on Georgia river names. And, um, and, and that voice again is in my head. And so it makes me want to find anything that Dorinda has done or talk to her on the phone rather than email her because that voice is important. And then um, Robin Wall Kimmerer, um, and if you've ever read braiding sweetgrass, you get braiding sweetgrass. I tell people as good as braiding sweetgrass is, I like listening to Robin read it better because I can hear just a slight list when she says strawberries. So, um, and she gets all of the Potawatomi names right. So, you know, I think that for me, those are sort of a, what's that, five? Um, but, you know, there, there are 20 more and John's always sending me stuff and sending me links and, and educating me. So, yeah, but, but I, I thought those are women who are having an influence on how I write. And I think it's an important sensibility um, for me. Wonderful. Thank you both for those tips. All right, we're getting close. Um, and I, I do want to leave a little bit of time. We're going to run over a little bit, but it's okay, Jonathan already said. And P.S. Jonathan, before you remind me that when I thanked everyone, I did not thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for this and all things that you do for Pat Conroy Literary Center and for Pat's legacy. And I'm going to let that be the last thing I ask you guys, since we are marching forth here in honor of our friend Pat Conroy. Tell us a little, give us a little anecdote. Tell us a little, what, what matters to you about Pat Conroy's work? Hmm. Wanna go, Drew? Yeah, for me it is, and you'll hear me say, I, I think that any progress that really, that truly comes in any sort of, especially racial reconciliation will come out of the South. And I think Pat Conroy saw that. I know he saw that. And, and so standing on that ground and having my name anywhere near in the same universe is, is a greatest honor. And it makes me want to write more towards that legacy. So I'm grateful. So thank you, Jonathan. Thank you to the Conroy Center. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, John, for all you've done for me. <laughs> well, I mentioned earlier how important Prince of Tides was for me. Um, I've always taught it when I when I the few times I've taught it and um, it's a big book. It's hard to teach it in a, in a class. But when I have um, I've always taught it as a nature book. I've always taught it as a book that's centered in, 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 a, in a place, place based book. 
And he taught me, I mean, I go back and read some of those passage, passages over and over now, those early passages where he's describing the beach and the marsh. Um, and um, he's just, you know, he, everybody knows he's a poet. He just didn't have a book of poems, but, um, but that, that was so important to me and such an, um, and, and also just, I want to just thank Jonathan and, and, and thank um, Sandra um, for the, for his friendship as well, because the, the, I, I didn't know him for long bef before he passed, but he made me laugh so many times during that time. He, anytime he'd see me, he'd say, John Lane, Chattooga man, <laughs> because he, he loved my book about the Chattooga River and he, he would talk to me about it a good bit. And, um, and it, it just having him as a, a friend and um, to know that he, he read so widely in, in everything, poetry, um, nonfiction, fiction, um, meant, meant the world to, um, to us all, all of us who were in the Story River family. Yes, indeed. Yes, yes. John and I are brother and sister in the Story River family with novels coming out. John, I always, anytime I'm on the stage with, with John Lane, I also have to mention that John is like part of our family because John was the mentor and advisor to my nephew, who's like my son, Andrew. And so he, John Lane is a, is a great favorite in our family. All right, I'm, I put my glasses on to look here in the chat box and see what we might have for questions. If someone has a question, if you wanna type it in quickly, I've got, um, Charlene is asking, can the both of you talk a bit about the difference or sameness regarding the terms landscape and environment? Okay, so I kind of touched on that with the, with the writing. You wanna take that? I'll say just very quickly, um, to me, landscape has always been a cultural term. It's divide, defined by our ideas about, about a place, whether they're artistic ideas or historical ideas. And that's what defines landscape for me. Environment has always seemed more, um, um, more science-y, more, more social science-y, science-y. I mean, it's, it does, it's not so much so cultural to me. Um, it's got more data behind it, although Drew will tell me right away that story is data. But, um, but, but landscape is cultural and environment is more, is more um, data-driven for me, for me. Environment is the cloud. <laughs> it's everything, it's, it's everything, right? Landscape to me is textured. Um, you know, the, 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 the environment is almost um, the high tech uh, filling that, that may keep us warm or maybe too warm, but we never really know exactly what it is. <coughs> Landscape is, as John said, it's the culture, it's the quilt that you know your grandmother put together um, piecemeal. And so it has a very different sort of um, tactile and palpable feel to it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Nancy is asking, why does Drew think the South will lead the way in the nation's racial reckoning? I mean, I have been wondering uh, as, a, as a farm boy of color, like you grew up, up with the with this um, aid for black farmers and the stimulus package, you were of course the first person that I thought about. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that too. Thank you, Nancy, for the question. Thank you, Nancy. Well, first of all, um, we got to deal with one another every day. I, you know, and and no offense to my friends in far flung northeastern or northwestern or other places, who would tell me that the South is doomed. When you're in a homogenous environment, and then you can tell me how I deal in a heterogeneous one. You know, we, 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 we practice life together down here in ways that other people don't practice life together. But then, so, so here, you know, there's a reason when you look at the civil rights movement, that that movement, it's not that Jim Crow only happened in the South. I hate when people just say Jim Crow South because it was happening all over this country. Um, you know, and so we have these conversations. People ask me, were you surprised when Christian was assaulted in Central Park? I said, no, not at all. I said, a lot of people were shocked that it happened in Central Park. I said, but 
you have to consider where we are, what we deal with on a daily basis. And I think it, at the very least, me encountering people who are different than me on a daily basis makes a difference. When I can go for weeks, months, and only see one or two of somebody different, that ain't practice. So we, 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 we're here and we're knee deep in it. You know, it's sort of, eventually you gotta get in that mud, eventually. And, um, and I think that's, and there's so many things that are shared here culturally, right? The science even tells you how genetically mixed up we are here. And those are all reckoning. So the reckoning, and I'm not saying it's gonna be pleasant in some kumbaya moment, but I'm just saying this is, this, is the, this is the epicenter. And if you don't deal with the epicenter, you're only nibbling at the edges and, and that doesn't work. And we've done enough of that. So I just think this is, you know, Dr. King made great strides elsewhere in this country, but it came out of here. There's a reason that he went down to the Penn Center right? As opposed to going somewhere else to find sort of this voice. So I could be wrong, right? But um, I take the challenge to, to be better than we were and to somehow lead in it. Um, I never heard John Lewis decry the South as a place that he did not want to return to his home. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right, we've got a question from Melissa Conroy. Our participants are many Conroys today from Pat's sister, Kathy, and the girls are here. We so much appreciate that and love having you. But so Melissa is asking, does creative visual exploration figure into your work and study of nature? True, looks like in an art, looks like he's in an art studio. <laughs> yeah, the thicket here. Melissa, all the time, uh, you know, all the time from, you know, John was talking about looking out at those stars last night and I'm thinking about those stars, but I'm thinking about underneath those stars are birds that are migrating by them, right? So, so that visual, even though I may never see them, that visualization is something that's, that's constant um, and, and, and trying to learn better day is, as John would tell you, you know, to paint those scenes. So it pay, plays a heavy role in, in what I do. Thank you, Melissa, for that question. I, and I want to apologize to everybody that I'm getting darker and darker <laughs> as the session goes on, as the sun moves behind me. I, uh, Sounds like a novel, John. <laughs> Sounds like he's been hanging out with Ju Drew Lanham so yeah, much that he's, yeah. his darkness is coming yeah. out. Yeah. Hey. So um, in my career, I have published four um, books where I collaborate with artists. And it's been very, very powerful to me. I have two books of, three books of photography, um, collaboration with three different, well, with more than three. Um, one book um, about the Saluda River, where there were four photographers. And then, and then I had a book um, where I collaborated with Phil Wilkinson at the coast on the alligator biologist, he's a photographer. And then I had a, um, Rob McDonald is a genius photographer from, from, um, from um, Virginia Military Academy. And we did a book together on my father's, the objects that my father had left behind after 50 years after he died. And then a, a printmaker named um, um, Doug Whittle did illustrations for my dead father poems for the book that came out of them. And so I've always, um, it's been so important for me to travel with scientists and to travel with artists. Those are the two people that I get my most um, inspiration from. And I also am a very bad sketcher in my travel journal. If I, if I reached over here and pulled out, pulled out a journal, and you can't see it because of the, the um, um, let's see if I can. I probably pulled out one without a sketch in it. I did. But anytime I travel, I just sketch constantly. And I have a bag full of colored pencils I carry with me. And, and I've often thought about taking some courses to become better 
but um, I don't know what it would mean to be better because I'm doing fine, you know, in my journal. And I, I'm sure Melissa would tell me that um, if you're doing it, you're doing it. So, um, so um, it's been very important for me. You're doing it, you're doing it. Well, fellas, <laughs> you have done it here today. This has been an absolute pleasure. I'm not seeing other um, questions. So I'm gonna take that as a, as a cue that, that folks are ready to get on out there and enjoy this beautiful afternoon. So thank you once again, Drew Lanham, John Lane. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Holland, everybody at the Conroy Center. And thank you, Conroy's. Yes, thank you to yes. everybody. For being here. This has been great fun. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.